Hi guys, welcome to episode 17 of the One Small Change podcast. On today's show, we have Dale Pinnock, also known as the Medicinal Chef. Dale is a nutritionist, Sunday Times bestselling author, TV presenter and broadcaster. And unlike many people discussing nutrition on social media, Dale is the real deal. He has three degrees in nutrition, as well as having spent a lifetime cooking, working in kitchens, everything from kitchen porter up to head chef. Dale is now one of the top nutritionists in the country, frequently on television, either on the hit show uh, on ITV, Eat, Shop, Save, or being called upon as an expert on diet and food-related matters for national press. He is a best-selling author of 18 books, um, which is an incredible feat in itself, Uh, has his own podcast, Nutrition Nuggets, his own supplement range, and even his own nutrition-based course. So I definitely want to ask Dale in today's podcast how he gets so much done, because that is an incredible amount of work there. Um, You guys, uh, listeners, know how much I value good nutrition Uh, and that I feel it is the key to solving so many issues in people's lives. So I'm super excited to have this chat with Dale and go really deep into the details, the specifics um, in in what is often an oversimplified topic um, where actually the nuance with nutrition is everything. But we're going to we're going to peel out some real key takeaways that you guys can uh, can uh, implement into your daily lives. So, Dale, welcome. Lovely to have you on. Thanks for having me. No worries. It's lovely to see you. And uh, as I say, I'm really, really excited for today's talk. Oh, I'm, I'm absolutely obsessed and, and fascinated by nutrition um, and, uh, and how it can help us all to live healthier and happier lives. So, it's um, such a fundamental, isn't it? it? Absolutely. And it's just so often over, overlooked and it, it can be such a simple change. Uh, obviously, the name of this podcast is One Small Change. And I think changing how you eat is such a simple change that can have such a disproportionately beneficial outlook on your life absolutely so um i'd like to start off with a with a simple question which may actually not be a simple (laughs) question um but i saw there was a bit of a debate this week on your instagram yeah um which was is food medicine um and so Mm -hmm. what what's your what's the answer (laughs) well i I think really it's it's all about framing and context really i I think it it depends what you actually determine as being a medicine but if if you think about it the the concept of a medicine i mean you're you you know yourself as a as a dentist you would get you would you would prescribe a certain thing to deliver a certain influence upon physiology in order to reach a um, therapeutic end point you know when you when you kind of frame a medicine in that way then obviously there's many things that could come under that particular heading i mean when when we look at nutrition nutrition absolutely completely and utterly influences the internal biochemical terrain of our body on almost every single level it directly influences a billion different physiological processes and as such you can you have you potentially can manipulate diet in a way to manipulate physiological responses outcomes processes you can you know you can you can regulate inflammatory mediators you can regulate upregulate and downregulate the production of key enzymes by bringing certain nutrients into play so that's the context in which i describe food as medicine i think one of the, the thing that that really got up people's shirts the other day was that they they automatically assumed the question was is food an alternative to medicine i've never been of the alternative camp i'm not in the alternative alternative camp whatsoever i've come from a very very kind of conventional um educational background i mean when i first got into nutrition before i actually got educated in the subject i was kind of a little bit more in that alternative world perhaps and i was first discovering it and uh, getting wowed by it but i think that was that was like the really big issue um that came up in the debate that and also say, like say um, describing food as medicine triggers eating disorders. I was like, I'm, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. I'm pretty sure there's like like multiple psychological factors involved in someone developing an eating disorder. It's not like, oh look, food is medicine. I've seen it once on Instagram. That's it. All of us, all of a sudden, I've got issues. It's like, man, there's a lot of layers there. There's a lot of layers there. Sure, some of these things could potentially be triggered, triggering, but that's down to the individual rather than what what is triggering them because i mean otherwise i mean you know we kind of move into the territory of cancel culture and you know having to kind of shield and protect everyone in every day and nobody can cope with life on planet earth anymore i mean i know that might sound a bit harsh but 
That's listen. That's the that's the truth. So I guess really what it boils down to is like yes, I do. I believe that nutrition is a very valid, very powerful, massively evidence based key part of the entire therapeutic spectrum. Is it in and of itself the only answer? Very seldomly. I mean, sometimes in cases like things like type 2 diabetes, for example, most aspects of cardiovascular disease, then diet and lifestyle are going to be the real key um, therapeutic drivers of improvement of that condition. But then in most other things, if someone needs pharmaceutical intervention absolutely they need the pharmaceutical intervention but that doesn't mean that it's a passive process and they can't actively engage in their own health care as well they can change their diet they can look at managing their stress they can make sure they get more rest they can make sure they get in more physical activity all of those things link together in order to li- deliver that person to the end outcome which is improving their health so in that's that that's how i see it and um yeah it, it was very very bizarre seeing i mean obviously there was there was some real polls um you know some people were just just like oh i only look at nutrition and stuff like that oh, cool that's your choice absolutely um and there are other people where you know they 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 were getting overly facetious so it's, it's very interesting to see how it can how it can trigger such polarized views whereas i kind of sit in the middle it's just like it's like listen if i walk out of my office and get hit by a bus i don't want to see broccoli i want morphine i don't want it bloody quickly that's the thing it's like you know i'm completely in the middle it's just like my my sole purpose is to champion the virtues of nutrition in a therapeutic context that's it i mean I'm, i'm certainly not precious with regards to um you know nomenclature or 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 kind of um the syntax of it i don't care what you call it i mean call it a feather duster if you want as long as like we we give it the place at the table that it deserves yeah absolutely i think at the end of the day we all have to choose what we're going to eat we all have to eat so why not make that decision with a framework of actually i am what i eat everything that i eat is going to be converted into my cells which make up my physical body so there's no there's no denying that fact and i think the beauty of of using nutrition as a part of a therapeutic matrix i guess is that um it gives accountability to the individual it's it's in, in under their control and they can they can take control of it which is quite nice i think instead of relying on on the medicines to do their job which are obviously incredibly important and and have a a massive part to play in in the treatment of these things the covid-19 pandemic um is obviously at the front of everyone's minds at the moment um and there's obviously been a lot of press around vitamin d supplementation um as a dentist i've been i've been a massive advocate of vitamin d for a number of years with regards to uh bony healing and uh, and just healing in general and it, it, as you well know vitamin d is more of a a hormone than a vitamin and it has so many roles to play what are your thoughts on, um, as, a, as a more general point, on the role of food and supplementation on immune support and, and reducing inflammation and, and how that can help protect us against things like COVID-19? Well, certainly in the context of COVID, or probably maybe we should go slightly wider in terms of where the evidence base is at the moment. Most of the evidence base is around some of the other um that has arisen during times of other um, resp- upper respiratory tracts infection um, epidemics or pandemics, so SARS, MERS, and in some of the severe flu seasons. That's where most of the data has come from. There's early stage data around, like you know, C nineteen patients, but most of that has been observational rather than interventional. So um, certainly, the intervention studies have shown that what seems to happen is people that are at a good vitamin d status at the point of infection and this is the really important distinction so rather than it being an intervention when someone already has the infection people that are at a good vitamin d status at the point of infection tend to fare better with these very very aggressive upper respiratory tract or you know sort of systemic infections and it's all down to um the cytokine response. One of the key things that we know about um, about the the pathophysiology or, or, of COVID nineteen, and this is true for you know for very very bad flu and for for other things like MERS and stuff like that, is that there is a cytokine storm. So <clears throat> for people that aren't aware of of the cytokines, cytokines are, are uh, messenger proteins that regulate many aspects of um, immune function. 
different cytokines will deliver different messages to different cell lines within the immune system to orchestrate different events. Now, in the early stage of infection, the normal response in our body is that we get a very, very focused, localized, acute inflammation. This acute inflammation causes like very, very rapid um, vasodilation in that area to the point where, where the vessels will actually open and gaps will start to appear in the vessel wall so that white blood cells that move to the area via means of chemotaxis, they get they get kind of beckoned forth by one group of cytokines. So that the cytokines will say, look, there's a problem, come here quickly. And another group of cytokines will cause this localized acute inflammatory response. So when the white cells arrive to the, the, the site of infection, they can quickly squeeze through um, the blood vessels and get straight into the the affected tissue and then as the immune system starts to, to to kind of win the war another group of cytokines will come along and start to down regulate that that acute inflammation as things start to ease out but what happens with with things like COVID-19 is that that acute inflammatory response doesn't get met with the down regulation it just keeps going and, and we move into what's called the cytokine storm where you just keep getting this constant up regulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines that keeps driving these inflammatory responses so obviously you get localized damage within within the lungs and within the respiratory tract but also this leads to systemic clotting this has led to systemic organ failure in, in patients that have been really really hard hit and what vitamin D seems to do, or certainly what seems to happen in patients that have good vitamin D status at the point of infection, is that that aggressive cytokine response doesn't happen. It's like, yeah, they're, they're still going to get some kind of symptom. They, you know, they may even need um, clinical intervention, but they don't fare as badly because it seems to be regulating the inflammatory response driven by cytokines. So that's one that's one way that um, nutrition can affect the immune system. But then beyond vitamin D, you look at things like zinc. I mean, how relevant zinc is to, to something as aggressive as COVID, I don't know. But I mean, in, in the broader picture of the, um, the interplay between nutrition and the immune system, zinc is used by our white blood cells to actually manufacture genes that then regulate the way in which those white cells respond to infection or indeed respond to cytokine messaging. So zinc helps write the software that controls the hardware, right? Um, but then the thing that I really get excited about, I get excited about probably, you know, need more of a social life, I don't know, um, mushroom polysaccharides. Mushroom polysaccharides. Yeah, now yeah, now these 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 have had over I mean, we're probably coming up with about 43, 44 years of clinical research in the US and in Japan. I mean, most of the the really hard hitting research has come from the Kobe Pharmaceutical University. So that's that's you know just outside of Osaka and Kobe, um, led by Dr. Hiroki Namba. And um the mushroom polysaccharides, polysaccharides very, very large high molecular weight complex sugars basically they're a type of sugar these, these particular sac uh, polysaccharides uh, called beta glucans are a type of sugar that don't actually get broken down they you know they come out the other end intact but they seem to have this amazing influence on the immune system and several things have have, have been shown in the research i mean the one thing that that it can do is actually that they can do is actually raise the number of natural killer cells so it's been very they've been very very widely studied in the context of cancer because one of the things that happens when a primary tumor actually starts to get its own vasculature because obviously when when a, when a tumor is just like a a few cells in size it doesn't cause that much of a problem but then when it gets to a certain point because it's stealing oxygen and nutrients from the surrounding tissue we get this process called angiogenesis which is where where the body will suddenly give that tumor its own blood supply so that it stops stealing it from the surrounding tissues but as soon as it does that that's it it's 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 like throwing petrol on a bonfire but at that stage there, there's there's chemical messengers that are pumped out from the tumor that can actually down regulate the number of natural killer cells natural killer cells are the only cell line within our immune system that can adequately detect a cancerous cell and destroy it so the tumor starts to look after its own interests which is you know it, it's quite, quite fascinating the process but also you know it's very nefarious as well it's quite scary when you think about it but mushroom polysaccharides have been shown to elevate natural killer cell numbers quite aggressively also increasing um macrophage numbers and phagocytosis so um and th uh, increase the rate in which phagocytes move to the site of infection but 
Another fascinating thing that they do is call something called uh, TH1, TH2 shift. So this has been studied in the context of people with with uh, allergies, particularly atopic issues like asthma, hay fever, eczema, those type 2 hypersensitivity reactions. Um, these are driven by antibodies. You've got antibody-based responses and you've got non-specific responses. Those are the two two kind of... I mean, it's a bit of a crude way of describing it, but the two main branches of, of immunity. One tends to be active and the other one tends to be suppressed. It's like a seesaw. Uh, TH1, TH2 shift causes the antibody-mediated responses to be down-regulated and causes um, non-specific responses to be up-regulated. So people with those kind of allergies have found incredible relief from their symptoms. So, you know, there, there's lots of interesting ways in which they've been applied, but it's how they work, which is absolutely fascinating. You would think, because of the, you know, the breadth of effects that they have, that there would be that they would have to get into systemic circulation. There would have to be some kind of ligand receptor relationship going on, but it's not the case at all. It's all driven by cytokines again, because they come out the other side intact. It, it's been found that what they do is they interact with a, like little po- pockets of tissue throughout the digestive tract called Peyer's patches. Peyer's patches are like a, a little surveillance. They're, they're they're an outcropping of our lymphatic tissue, really. But they're like little surveillance stations with very specific cell lines residing in there that are constantly monitoring gut contents because obviously the digestive tract is a very um, easy route for opportunistic pathogens to enter the body. So it needs to be tightly policed. You've got these little little surveillance stations that are constantly monitoring what's going on. It's theorised, I mean, certainly the, the response is is the way that I'll describe, but the it's theorised that the reason it happens is that the, the mushroom polysaccharides very closely resemble um, extracellular polysaccharides displayed on bacterial cells. So when they come into contact with the Peyer's patch, they will actually, you know, things like dendritic cells, antigen-presenting cells, those kind of cell lines will will recognise a potential threat and will actually cause a cytokine cascade that causes all of this upregulation of these key cells. Fascinating. And that's from mushrooms. So is that, is that, so, present, is that present in all mushrooms? More in some? Because I know I, I, I drink a... Uh, uh, I'm quite a fan of mushroom tea, reishi mushroom tea for, for relaxation. You like reishi in tea, mate. You're hardcore. That is bitter it as is, anything. It is yeah. quite bitter, well, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, well re- reishi's, reishi's very, very good. Reishi's very, very high in it, as are, um, you, know, you know, very high in beta-glucan, as are maitake. Um, as are there's another type called Coriolis, which uh, is a turkey tail mushroom. It's not an edible edible mushroom, but you, you see it growing on on like dead logs in the woods, and it's kind of got like, the banding on it, like green, grey, and white sort of stripes on it. Apparently, looks like the back end of a turkey. I've not really right. studied that, but you know that's <laughs> that's that's where they get the name. Um, and in terms of the everyday edible ones that we get in this country, I mean, if you're lucky enough to get maitake, absolutely get those because they're fantastic. Um, Oyster mushrooms. Okay. But generally, the data has all, all been around um, preparations like supplements. Right. Standardized extracts. So you can get all of those in supplements very, very easily. So is it, is it a specific mushroom extract supplement that you'd recommend? All of those, all of those mushrooms that I mentioned, so reishi, coriolis, um, shiitake, they're very rich in, in uh, beta-glucans as well, um, cordyceps. Yep. Um, chaga, all of those will have very high polysaccharide counts and all of those you can get in supplements. I would say go for a blend if possible mm. with as many of those mushrooms in uh, as possible. And, and when it comes to supplements, I think it's it's an important topic to discuss um, because it is a bit of a, again, a, a bit of a wild west with regards to the listeners and, and knowing what to choose. Um, I'm using a product called Heights. Um, which I've spoken about quite a lot on this podcast, which um, the founder actually came on as a guest previously, and it's a very well-sourced product, and they put a lot of effort into that. But uh, I know you have your own supplement range, don't you? So what, what, have, you, what have you put into that? Um, well, it's, it's early stages, and I I'm, I'm, I'm certainly don't want to be like one of those brands that has like every nutrient you could possibly think yeah. of. as a Because, you know, there's billions out there, and it's just like, well, so what? What I wanted to do, I mean, it really, it was born out of frustration. I, don't, I never really had the intention of, of bringing out a supplement mm. line. But so many times I was... I would be asked about things like fatigue or immune support and stuff like that. And I'd be like, well, this is really important. This is really important. This is really important. And someone would end up, and you know, this was happening in my own clinic as well. I'd end up giving, giving patients a long list 
of different supplements to get that would end up costing them a fortune and they would end up rattling because they would have to take yeah. so much. Especially with things like things like fatigue and improving um, mitochondrial sufficiency and things like that. There was no one combining decent levels of magnesium, decent levels of coenzyme Q10, plus all of the B vitamins, plus adaptogens as well in one standalone product. Mm. And I was like, why on earth not? I mean, probably because with, with, with mine, you have, to, you have to take four a day. So people are like, oh, I just want a one a day. It's like, well, you're not going to get the result yeah. then. It's like, this, you know, this, this, is, this is here if you want the result. If you, you know, if you want to do a one a day, then take all the individual separate ones. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's your own choice. But I just wanted to kind of create blends that address some of the, you know, the every everyday kind of issues that are just minor imbugerances rather than sort of serious issues. Mm. So um, fatigue and tiredness, immune support. There's a vitamin D. There's going to be there's going to be other um, lines coming later in the year. There's going to be like a really good omega three and uh, a few other bits like stress products, sleep products, stuff like that. Um, but it, I'm not going hammer and tongs at it yet. Yeah. Um, I'm waiting for the world to open up a little bit more so I can get out there and start doing stuff in stores and, and, and getting it out into retail. Um, yeah, so it's 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 just like a little it's a, it's a little side thing at the moment. Yeah, good fun though, isn't it? Bringing your own product to life. It's a it is it it's is a, been a big part of my my life for the last year. Um, you mentioned omega three there, and omega three. Yeah. I think I've I've seen some fascinating studies around omega three. One of the most interesting ones was. Um, one done on uh, young offenders in uh, in juvenile detention centres, and I think they showed a uh, they did a randomised double blind controlled trial, a placebo versus um, omega three, and they showed a seventy five percent reduction in violent offences in the individuals who had the correct amount of omega three, which I thought was amazing. I mean, we could we could yeah. massively reduce aggression and sort of that rage uh, factor across the world um, by correctly um controlling the nutrition of all humans so t- tell us what your thoughts are on omega-3 and, and all of that yeah i mean that that's not the first time that kind of observation has been made i mean if you look at the work of um professor joseph hiblin who was um head of nutrition with the world health organization for a very long time he's one of the world authorities on um fatty acids and behavior and, and, and brain development he he did a, a huge huge populate like multi population study and he mapped out this beautiful graph that I know like you know the likes of Patrick Holverdal was ref- referenced this all the time and it, it is a little bit kind of bold statement contentious kind of things but you can you can map a country's murder rate by its intake of seafood I mean I don't know whether that is <laughs> fascinating the right conclu- the right conclusion to draw but. Um, possibly on fatty acid profile, possibly on um, the you know the quality of the diet. But what was anyone saying about socioeconomic? I'm sure there's a lot of variables there, not accounted for. All of that for. kind of stuff, exactly, <laughs> exactly right. But you know, I'm just what I'm saying is like you know, obviously there's been a little facetious there, but there's been a lot of these kind of observations happen. I mean, a good, a good friend of mine actually from Oxford University, Dr. Alex Richardson, she's done some amazing work around this, particularly with um, with childhood. Uh, behavioural issues. Omega-3 is such an important substance for the health of the brain on a multitude of levels. I mean, just if, if we look at um, look at it in the context of children to start with, DHA, docosahexaenoic acid, which is one of the two long-chain omega-3 fatty acids that are relevant to human physiology, is absolutely vital for neurological development, particularly in these early years when there's this this kind of rapid formation of new neural pathways all the time when brain plasticity is going bananas dha is so important because it is a key structural component of the myelin sheath so the myelin sheath is like a you know the fatty outcropping of the of the um neuron membrane that's sort of dotted along the line the length of a neuron in small capsules and the, the gap between the capsules is what the um the action potential jumps along so it's really really important for neurological function but neurological development and it starts um it starts in utero as well, so um, expectant mothers, as soon as, as soon as they know they're pregnant, need to up their intake of DHA for um, neurological development of the fetus. But then, obviously, the the child right up until they're you know sort of twenty one, twenty two, 
real good focus on DHA for that neurological development. But then obviously there's another fatty acid as well called EPA, icosapentaenoic acid. Those two long chain fatty acids. I mean, there's a lot of omega-3 fatty acids. Well, there's, there's four, ALA, EPA, DHA, DPA. ALA is what you find in plants. Really, it's as good as useless because it has to go through significant enzymatic conversion. It has to be, um, you know, have more double bonds added to it. It's elongated. Um, human beings are really bad at doing that conversion. You could be eating chia seeds all day long and you ain't going to be replete in omega-3. There's other ways of getting it if you if you choose to follow a plant-based diet. It, you can get it. You just have to be creative. But the two that have relevance to our physiology are EPA and DHA. So DHA we've spoken about. It's one of the key structural um, fatty acids, also important for the rods and the cones in the eyes, also important for cell membranes. <clears throat> there, there is, I mean, we'll get onto to the inflammation side in a bit. Um, then the other th- the other reason why why DHA is important and EPA has some role to play here as well is um, in neurotransmitter release and reception. Okay, so obviously our nerve cells don't touch. So anyone that's that's kind of up on their neurophysiology know that there's a gap between our neurons. Most of the information is carried through the CNS via electrical impulse, via an action potential. But once the action potential reaches the end of the neuron that it's firing across, it can't jump the gap to the next neuron. So that electrical impulse needs to be converted into a chemical signal that will leave one and and send the message to the next via this synaptic junction. With the right intake of... EPA and DHA, you get sufficient um, kind of flexibility and health of the membrane that the neurotransmitters that are held in little vesicles, these little bubbles in the in the end of of the um, the presynaptic neuron, they kind of move move towards the 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 outer membrane of of the neuron they're in, fuse with it, and then spit their contents out into the um, into the synaptic space. Those fatty acids make sure that that process is done as efficiently as possible. And then those chemical signals are sent from the, the presynaptic neuron across the, the, the um, synaptic space to the postsynaptic neuron. The postsynaptic neuron has the neurotransmitter receptor on it, so it's actually receiving the signal. DHA and EPA are vital for maintenance of the receptor structure to make sure that that receptor is working as well as possible. So you've got this kind of improvement of um, neurotransmitter utilization going on there. So that's possibly a real big factor in some of these behavioral changes that that are associated with fatty acids. It's just making some of these these key pathways work more effectively. And then the thing that gets really really exciting in terms of fatty acids and, and, and omega-3 particularly is that they can modulate inflammation and as we know inflammation we're not talking acute inflammation here like we spoke about in con- in the context of infection what we're talking about here is chronic inflammation these are subclinical chronic inflammatory changes that take place in tissues over over years over decades that can be responsible for the development of many chronic degenerative diseases you know, so cardiovascular disease, it's a inflammatory disease at its heart. It's its um, endothelial damage and the corresponding inflammatory cascade that gives rise to atheroma. Then there's a lot of uh, research around neuroinflammation and things like depression and also other more serious mental health issues as well. And one of the things that the omega-3 fatty acids, the long chain omega-3 fatty acids can do is bring inflammation, chronic inflammation, back into check. The the way that they do this is one of the main metabolic end products of fatty acid metabolism is a group of compounds called prostaglandins. Prostaglandins, they're, they're... they're communication compounds. They regulate several things. I mean, they, they regulate some aspects of smooth muscle contraction. They regulate some aspects of pain signaling. But the main thing that they regulate is the inflammatory response. You've got three types of prostaglandin, series one, series two, series three. Series one is mildly anti-inflammatory. Series two is aggressively pro-inflammatory. Series three is aggressively anti-inflammatory. So two of them are anti-inflammatory, but then you've got this one in the middle that's like a real kind of kick butt 
hardcore inflammatory stimulant. Different fatty acids are metabolized to form different prostaglandins. Now, you've heard we're talking about omega three. You've you've heard of omega six as well. This is the other um, essential fatty acid. So we do need it in our diet, but we need it in very very tiny amounts. In very tiny amounts, it's fed through a, a specific metabolic pathway that turns it into these compounds that benefit like the brain and the nervous system and also uh, hormonal functions, particularly in women. Um, that pathway is very rapidly saturated. If we take in more omega-6 at the point that that pathway is saturated, then it gets shuttled down a different metabolic pathway, gets turned into something called arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid then goes straight into that PGE2 pathway. It gives rise to the series 2 prostaglandin that switches on and exacerbates inflammation. Omega-3 fatty acids, on, on the other hand, particularly the long-chain variety, actually give rise to the series one and the series three so dha that we spoke about that's important in the structural aspects of you know you know many different different parts of the body that can also give rise to series one prostaglandin so that can actually be converted into the mildly anti-inflammatory series one prostaglandin also converts into another newly discovered anti-inflammatory compound called a delta resolvin the epa the icosapentaenoic acid, that's the one that feeds directly into the pathway that gives rise to the series 3 prostaglandin. That is the really aggressively anti-inflammatory prostaglandin. So I know I've kind of basically, basically chewed your ear off on this, but the take-home is if we elevate our omega-3 intake and we reduce our intake of omega-6 from processed foods and vegetable oils and stuff like that, we can keep this chronic inflammation in a manageable level, and that can have a significant long-term impact on risk of certain degenerative disease. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, inflammation is a, is a massive thing that we all should be thinking about when we're eating um, and when we're putting anything into our body, really. So you mentioned there, so vegetable oils are out. Um, and mm. uh, what foods would you recommend for uh, getting omega-3 into the body? The number one thing is going to be is going to be oily fish, um, salmon, mackerel, herrings, things like that. I know a lot of people are, are conscious of... Um, whether it's environmental aspects or you know moving to you know concerned with animal welfare and things like that if you do follow a plant-based diet then you have to supplement no argument no discussion you have to supplement yes you can you can you can get loads of omega-3 in plants but it's in the form of ala ala has to go through this um, enzymatic conversion to be turned into the long chain epa and dha that our body can actually put to use you're looking at about a 6% conversion of um, ALA into EPA if you're doing well. And you're looking at about a 04 to 0.5% conversion of ALA into DHA if you're doing well. Apart from pregnant women that ramp up the production to about 25%. So you could be eating walnuts and chia seeds and flax seeds all day. And they will give you a myriad of health benefits for a whole host of other reasons. You know, other sort of um, lignans and vitamin E and, and polyphenols and all these great things. I mean, they're wonderful, healthy foods, but don't expect them to give you the omega three that you need. You'll need to find a supplement derived from algae, so it kind of fits in with the, the whole um, plant based diet philosophy, but that contains both EPA and DHA. I mean, algae derived DHA has been on the market for for twenty years plus, but it's only within the last five years or so that the technology has been available to actually extract epa from uh, algae as well so now you can get epa and dha in an algae derived supplement brilliant and you mentioned there um the uh i guess a topic that's pretty fresh on most people's minds at the moment if they if they've watched seaspiracy on netflix but um i haven't seen you haven't watched it it's it's quite shocking um uh, and obviously it's designed to be um, inflammatory uh, and to sort of deri- uh, drive a, a, a specific narrative, but um, what's your view on on sustainability of of fish? Are there any fish fish that you think are um, more likely? Because I mean, if you haven't watched the show, the trawling of of sort of the classic big fish like cod and yeah. salmon and tuna. Uh, and the implication on that on on the environment and on the welfare of the animals and on the quality of the fish as well yeah um is quite shocking but are there any fish that you think are lying caught or farmed or whatever it is i have to be honest i i don't know enough about the issue and the data to to give any kind of 
real comment on that because it's it's never really been my focus. I, I think I think we always have to have our one thing. Um, my one thing is always the health impact of these kind of things. That's that's where, that's where I put my energy. That's that's the lane that I tend to stay in. But anecdotally, a little thing there. Um, I've been a scuba diver since I was fourteen. So I've been, you know, nearly thirty years I've been diving, and when I kind of think back to the early days of diving the Mediterranean, in you know, we're probably talking about ninety three, ninety two, ninety three, starting to dive around the Mediterranean and stuff like that. When I was first training, it used to be absolutely alive. You know, they're like you know, see huge shoals of sea bream and um, loads of mullet, and you know, it was it was it was beautiful. It was alive. But then over, I mean, I think it was three years ago now, four years ago, um, I did a wreck dive in Cyprus, which is one of the places where I used to dive a lot, and it, it was just devoid. It was only when you actually got really really deep that you would see. Um, you would see some grouper, you would see the odd tuna, but there was just nothing swimming around there whatsoever. And if I compare that to sort of diving in, in the Indian Ocean, that obviously doesn't have the same kind of um, fishing pressure, especially close to some of these small islands. You know, you look at like the, like the Maldives and Mauritius and stuff like that. It's not really got the same... It's got different issues. I mean, the issue there is coral bleaching. Um which I've seen as well. I mean, sort of comparing the, the Seychelles to the Maldives, I was di- diving in the Seychelles and it, just dead reefs. It was, it was, uh, it was awful. Yeah, I mean, there's still, still lots of amazing sea life, still lots of rays and turtles and beautiful things. But um, comparing that to the Maldives, where it's still very, very lush and there's a lot of projects going on to maintain the reefs, um, I can see the difference. So that's that's my that's that's my own my own personal experience with it. Actually seeing changes in marine life in areas where there there is more intense fishing and where particularly where there's a lot of tourism and uh, you know massive sort of seafood trades and stuff. But in terms of data about specific species and stuff like that, I just I, I I've I've never researched it. I've never looked into it because it's never really been. It's never really been my my subject that I discuss. It's something that obviously, obviously I'm kind of mindful of, and you know I don't want to sort of do anything that that um, creates a, a huge problem for for the earth or for other people or anything like that. But my subject, where I put all of my energy and focus, is is the health and nutrition. Okay, then. So just to finalise on that, so for omega three things like salmon, herring, mackerel some sort of fish, uh, oily fish or if you're uh, following a plant-based diet go for an algae based supplement and then to reduce the omega-6 or to keep it un- under wraps kick out the vegetable oils yeah and, and apart from olive oil olive oil is good because the main the, the dominant fatty acid in there is oleic acid which is an omega-9 and that has no bearing on it whatsoever um so things like you know your regular vegetable oil sunflower oil soybean oil corn oil rapeseed oil sorry to break that to all the people that think it's like the the um the elixir of yeah. health it's a big it's a big uh, debate in my house i i'm a big fan of uh well i, I love high quality olive oil anyway just because it tastes incredible yeah. Um, but also I'm a bit of a fan of, of coconut oil for cooking with. Where yeah. where do you lie on, on coconut oil? Is that? Um, yeah, it's all right. I mean, you see some of the ridiculous claims that are made about mm-hmm. it. It's, um, it's, it's kind of laughable. I like it for very high temperature work for the simple fact that because it's a saturated fat, um, you don't get any kind of trans fat formation at high temperature because you can't you can't get trans fats formed if there's no double bonds in the molecule. So, um, you know, it's just kind of isomerism. The, the, the chemistry nerds, it's just the isomerism. Uh, you add you add like enough of a, a temperature to these unsaturated fats, you, you you get you get it flipping around eventually. So it goes into the trans isomer. Um, that doesn't happen with a saturated fat because there's no no double bonds for it to spin on. So. I will use it for things like roast potatoes. Oh my God, best roast potatoes ever. <laughs> uh, really, really good with, with uh, you know, it kind of gives you that goose fat kind of crunch. Um, but obviously it's got that, got that higher smoke point. Um, that's, that's about it. I, I really don't use it much. I mean, I know some people that are obviously fans of a keto diet and stuff like that might add it to coffee or, you know, use it to, to kind of, falsely potentially put them in into a state of ketosis i mean they 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 might see ketones when they pee on a stick but they might not necessarily be in true nutritional ketosis but you know that's a a different a different Mm. thing but yeah i don't i don't use a great deal of it i just think it's good for high temperature stuff interesting so so you've mentioned their um plant-based diet a couple of times uh keto there there's obviously there's so many 
different opinions around the health benefits of different diets, paleo and pescatarian and even pegan. I heard uh, Mark Hyman talking about the other day, which is oh, that's Mark's thing, uh, yeah. pescatarian vegan combination, um, which I thought was quite interesting. Oh no, sorry, paleo uh, vegan combination. Um, but where, where I, I heard you say that you you were, I think, plant based for twenty years. Is that right? So where, where do you lie now yeah. on your your own? I'm still very close. To, diet? I'm still very close to that. Yeah, I mean, because because plants are always the the nutritional heroes. Um, I, but but I am more omnivorous now. But still, everything is is plant dominated. It's like, what do I have with my plants instead of what do I have with my meat or whatever? Um, I you know what I I don't think uh, this is really interesting. Uh, there's especially in the weird and wacky world of social media, people have got almost religious level fanaticism about their dietary camp. You know, they will identify some with something, whether it's because of their own personal experience or that they've found improvement by following a certain type of diet or something resonates with their habits. I mean, especially with, you know, you look at look at the early versions of Atkins. People love good news about bad habits. They're like, yeah, I can have bacon and cream all day. Woohoo. So they're like, they fight that cause because it fits in well with their lifestyle and with their habits. It's become very, very tribal. And there's so much kind of debate around, you know, what's the best diet? And for any of us that are actually, you know, I mean, I've I've been in this industry 26 years. I've like my my life has been has been nutrition. If someone asked me what's the perfect diet, I would say I haven't got a clue. I haven't got I, I have not got a Scooby Doo, and I don't think anyone with any kind of scruples would be able to tell you what is the perfect diet because I don't think it exists. But I've the, here is a really interesting observation. Okay, you look at paleo diets, keto diets, macrobiotic diet raw food diet, vegan diet, uh, Ayurvedic approaches to eating, traditional Chinese um, medicine-derived diets. All of these things show, have have got huge anecdote behind them. You see people that have gone through incredible changes. You, You see people that have, you know, dramatically improved the picture with um, chronic illness. You've seen people that have lost huge amounts of weight. You've seen these incredible health transformations with every single one of those diets. Yet from the actual print, from the, the, the from the, the principal point of view, they're all like drastically different from one, one another. They're like diametrically opposed to one another. And that so many people get confused in that, in that, that they, they feel that it's a contradiction, but they're missing the point. They're missing. There, there is one thing that unifies every single one of those diets. One thing that unifies every single one. They're leaving out the rubbish that makes us sick in the first place. And that's and that's the key. That really is the key. And all of those diets, in one way or another, are built around whole foods. There's none of those diets that are telling you to go out and buy a ready meal. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, or you know, eat eat Oreos and um, and and drink fizzy drinks all day. They're none of them are telling you to do that. You know, they. One might say you're eating more grains. One might say you're eating more meat or whatever. But it's all whole foods. It's all going back to real food, and leaving out the junk that's making everyone sick. So that's where our focus really needs to be. It's like don't put ridiculous pressure on yourself to adhere to a specific framework because someone has said that's the framework to stick to. It's just think logically. How have we eaten for most of our time on this planet? I can tell you it's not the rubbish that is in the middle part of your yeah. supermarket. It's the stuff that's around the outside, right? So, you know, you're, the fruit and veg close to the door, the, you know, the, the fish and the meat and the, and, and the dairy counter and stuff towards the back. These stuff, the stuff that's around the outside, the stuff that's in the middle is food-like substances, to quote my, uh, Michael Pollan. Just build your, I mean, you know, and he's, he's pretty much hit it on the head. You know, they're in defense of food. It's like, eat food. So basically, when he says eat food, that's not being facetious. That's like actual whole food rather than the, the kind of processed rubbish. Not too much. Mostly plants. Simple. That's it. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. that's, it's really that simple. You know, you don't have to be vegan. You don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be low carb. You don't have to be low fat. You don't have to be anything. You don't have to put any ridiculous label on it. Just leave out the stuff that's, that's fueling chronic illness and you're going to be yeah. all right. Absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. I mean, of course, there are, yeah, there are a million and one nuances with nutrition in a clinical 
perspective and if you're actually working one-to-one with a patient and you will be kind of manipulating their diet in a specific way in order to derive a specific therapeutic outcome that's a completely different discussion but certainly on that that kind of day-to-day public health level it's just like leave out the junk that's making everyone sick focus on just good whole foods and you'll be all right i love that so simple and so easy for everyone to uh, to implement so um Normally, I start the show with uh, with with the origin story, but I think we've I've, I've got so excited with a number of other topics that we've uh, we, we, we've gone off forty five minutes on, on lots of other stuff. But um, I, I'm fascinated by the way that you got into nutrition um, and uh, and your specific sort of style of nutrition. I guess combining the sort of medicinal and and taste elements of it. But um, if you could tell the listeners about how you got into it and, and your issues with with your skin and and how that led to you becoming uh, the medicinal chef yeah well i mean I, I i found nutrition in the way that i think most people find it because i had my own health challenges there's not that many people i mean because at the age i was as well at 15 i don't think there's many people at 15 that are like yeah i want to study broccoli <laughs> Do you know what i mean it doesn't it really it doesn't happen it's because because i had my own my own health issues and i was trying to find a solution that i i realized how fascinating a subject it was um from the age of about 10 or 11, I started getting really bad acne. It was the summer of leaving primary school to go up to secondary school. That time in your life when you just start to be comparing yourself to your peers and, you know, you, you know the hormones kick in and you start to get into the, into that self-judgment phase and, uh, you know, the, the, the wave of angst that comes with that. And I started breaking out. My God, I looked like I'd been shot in the face with a blunderbuss. It was really, it was, it was really full on. And I tell you what, I'm so glad social media didn't exist then. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, talk, we're talking 89. We're talking 1989. I'm so glad social media didn't exist then. I mean, kids were little sods then. I mean, you can imagine like the, the, the kind of grief that I got. So if social media was there, my God. Um, anyway, I digress. I went to so many different practitioners. I went to like different dermatologists and, you know, doctors and people that had reputations of being fantastic with, with this kind of stuff. And I tried all of the topical antibiotics and the, the retinol preparations and the, the oral antibiotics, uh, you know, tetracycline, all of that kind of stuff. And nothing really made much of a difference. The only thing that I didn't do was Roaccutane. I just didn't want to go down that road. Um, Nothing really made that much of a difference. I mean, there would be mild improvements here and there, but it would always be this kind of static problem that, that showed no real sign of, of let up. And I got to about 15 and I was sat around at my friend's house one night feeling sorry for myself, just kind of talking about, oh, I'm so miserable because of the state of my skin. <laughs> and his mum his mum was in the kitchen at the time and she was like, look, unless you change what's going on on the inside, don't expect anything to change on the outside. I'm like, well, what do you mean? So like, well, have you thought about what you're eating? I mean, you, you're both sitting there having a fag. It's just like, <laughs> which we were. Um, and I hate to admit it as well. I mean, we were 15, but we just got back from the pub. Because uh, <laughs> I, I looked a little bit older. We always used to be able to get served. Yeah. So, yeah, we just got back from back from the pub. My, maid, my mate had made a fried egg sandwich and we were sat there smoking a fag. Brilliant. So, you know, it, she was, had a point. it was a very relevant... It was, she had a point. She had a point. And uh, obviously, as a 15-year-old boy, I was like, what? What are you on about? And then she lent me this book called Fit for Life by Harvey Diamond. I mean, you look at it now and some of the claims are a little bit outlandish but it's it's based around the principles of natural hygiene and you know high plant diet and that kind of stuff she gave me this book she said look just just have a read have a read and have a think i read this thing cover to cover in the weekend because even though you know i i kind of put that outward um protestation out there oh what are you talking about to be fair if someone had told me to sort of run out in the garden at midnight wrapped in tinfoil and it would have got rid of it i would have tried yeah. right um so i was pretty much ready for anything at that point and i read this book to cover to cover in a weekend and there was that light bulb moment there was that light bulb moment i suddenly realized that we could actively engage in our own healthcare, and i became absolutely obsessed now at that point we'd just sort of done gcses and stuff like that i grew up in the rave scene i wasn't particularly interested in academia I was interested in dark rooms, flashing lights, great music, <laughs> and everything that comes yeah. with it. And so I mucked about at school. I didn't really have much uh, qualification, but I'd all of a sudden got this inspiration and this drive. So 
I I read about a thousand books in you know less, in, in less than two years. Easy, I still got them. I mean, still got them in the garage, and there were piles and piles and piles of the things. And I used myself as a guinea pig. I tried every diet you could imagine. I just became absolutely obsessed with the subject. And then because I mucked around, I had to go and catch up with my education. Went and did uh, an access course. So I did um, psychology, philosophy, chemistry, um, and biology. And then eventually went to um, went to uni, did my first degree in human nutrition at Kingston, then went and did a second degree in herbal medicine at Westminster. And it's not because I necessarily wanted to be a medical herbalist. I was just very interested in plant biochemistry and phytochemistry and how these, these non-nutritional compounds in plant foods can still deliver um, an almost pharmacological effect even though they're not specifically nutrients. Mm. That stuff wasn't included on nutrition courses back then. It was all like anthropometry and, um, you know, using daft charts to calculate people's nutritional needs, which is nonsensical in itself. Um, so the only place I could study that was on a herbal medicine degree. It turned out to be a really great degree, actually, because the one thing that they, they always teach on the herbal degrees is the um, is clinical skills. So, <clears throat> you know, by the end of it, I was able to perform a cardiovascular exam. I was... I was you know, I understood cardio auscultation and like, you know, how to identify an ejection click and stuff like that. You ain't, you ain't going to get that on a nutrition degree, yeah. right? I mean, we, and we were basically like being at med school. It was, it was insane that that stuff was being taught in a more alternative practice. Um, so that brought a lot of value to my own clinical practice when I actually started seeing patients. And then after that, I, I was in, I was in practice for four or five years and doing some work with industry. And then decided to, to do a postgrad. So I did the postgraduate nutritional medicine at Surrey. And then yeah, and, that, and then here we are. Yeah. But then the obviously the, the the name the medicinal chef. I mean that that kind of because I've, I've cooked all of my life. I've been cooking since I was like four years old. L- literally, literally four years old. I'd always be in the kitchen with my mum, like, helping do something. And I was always very, very proficient in the kitchen, and I've always been a gannet as well. So I've always enjoyed good food. So, so, so that's that's been like a, a a key part of my life for a long time. And when I was studying this stuff, nobody was talking about like what the science actually means in real world day to day activities. It's like, okay, well, you know, we've got this amazing insight, but what does that mean for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? If I'm telling you, you know, if I'm talking to to a patient about this. They might be like, yep, interesting. Oh, yep, great. Okay. What the hell do I do with chemo? What do I have for breakfast? Okay. You want me to be on like a high polyphenol diet? What, 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 what do I do for lunch? Yeah. <clears throat> there was there was none of that kind of stuff. There was none of that kind of um, discussion, really. So it just seemed to me that it was the, the cooking and creating recipes was the perfect delivery system for the for the information and for the, for the science. And the, the, the name The Medicinal Chef is deliberately provocative. You know, as we saw with the uh, you know the the crazy debate on um, on Instagram, yeah. because I want people to think differently about the food that they eat. It's not just fuel. It's not just about weight loss. It's about so much more. It's it it can be a key driver in chronic disease, or it can be one of the most valid medicines in chronic disease. So I want people to think about it that way, and that's that's where the name came from, and um, and yeah, it kind of stuck. Well, I mean, you were you were clearly very ahead of your time because I mean, obviously, it's such a big topic now, um, and I think yeah, back I then mean, it would have been, as you say, much more straightforward in many. I've ways. been talking about this stuff. I've been talking about this stuff since the nineties, mm. you know, and there weren't many of us talking about that stuff. So, you know, it's certainly been part of, of paving the way for all of this. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, just on that skin point, are there any what, are there any foods that people can eat that are uh, that are good for the skin that are sort of simple to put into your diet? There's loads. There's loads. I mean, <clears throat> it really depends what the issue is. If whether you're talking about sort of day to day, just looking after the health of the skin, then omega three fatty acids are absolutely vital. Carotenoids, that you, you know, the the orange color pigment that you find in carrots, mangoes, sweet potatoes, um, those kinds of things. Those carotenoids, they're they're fat soluble antioxidants. So everyone's everyone always goes on about antioxidants for the yeah. skin. They're like, you know, they're like, oh look at this berry smoothie, fantastic for your skin because it's got antioxidants in it. It's like. Loads of antioxidants, not really going to do much for your skin. Right. Vitamin C might. Vitamin C might actually help with collagen production and that kind of stuff. But antioxidants for the skin need to be the fat-soluble variety. Right. You, even though there's thousands and thousands of antioxidant compounds, 
you could put them into two distinct cap, camps, water soluble and fat soluble. Water soluble, they're, they're active within our systemic circulation for a limited period of time. Then they're, they're broken down and they're excreted. Then you've got the fat soluble variety. The fat soluble variety, by their very nature, won't stay in circulation for very long. They've got an affinity for fatty, you know, for fatty tissues. So they will move out of, out of our circulation. And second to the brain, the most abundant fatty tissue in the body is the subcutaneous layer of the skin. That base layer where you've got where you've got collagen, elastin. You've got the pilosebaceous unit, which is where the sebaceous gland and the hair follicle meet. All these important structures that. I mean, collagen and elastin particularly, they, they're obviously very susceptible for, uh, to damage from ultraviolet radiation. And, um, you know, environmental pollutants, all of those kind of things can affect collagen and elastin. With those fat-soluble antioxidants, if you eat enough of them, they can actually accumulate in that, in that subcutaneous layer and offer localised protection against that kind of damage and then obviously i talked about the pilosebaceous unit that's the area that becomes inflamed and infected in an acne flare-up that localized um, antioxidant um, presence can can help to manage some of the inflammation as well and keep the keep the lesion at bay and then if, you, if you're talking about specific lesions as well with with acne zinc is vital so obviously at the beginning we spoke about the role that zinc has to play in immunity and clear an infection, so there's that side of it, but also zinc regulates the sebaceous glands. And where can we get zinc in our diet? Is it something that we need to supplement, or is it something that we can find in food? Um, if, 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 I'll tell you what, if, if I was dealing with like a teenage boy with acne, I would say definitely bring a supplement because suppl uh, zinc is so important for like testosterone metabolism and stuff like that. You would just need so much of it to do all of the different jobs that it's got to do and still stand the chance to deliver the therapeutic outcome. But for, for, for older people, I would say, work. Look at the diet first. So shellfish, prawns, um, crustaceans, anything like that, really, really uh, rich in zinc, squid, uh, yes, yeah, scallops, those kinds of things. Beef, chicken, pumpkin seeds, walnuts. So quite quite a lot of sources, sources, and that's good. Yeah. And yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier about kids, and, and again, there. Um, and I, I don't know if you've got kids yourself, but I, 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 no, I've got a cat. I've me. got I've got two, and um, well, oh, they uh, well the the older ones can certainly be fairly difficult to feed sometimes. Do you recommend yeah. supplementing for kids? And and if so, there's sort of some really you mentioned obviously Amiga, the Amigas earlier, but you know what I I think it's probably a good idea for you know a good daily multivitamin and the omega three fatty acids. I think that's relevant to to virtually everyone. Other than that, make sure that you you're working with like a uh, someone that specialises in paediatric nutrition because you don't want to get doses wrong or anything Absolutely, like that. With, yeah. a da with a daily multi, with a daily ch children's multi that's already weighed out for mm. you, a one a day, then that's going to be a really really good idea. Even I mean, th there is this 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 argument as well. This is there's lots of arguments in nutrition, <laughs> yeah. as you probably noticed. Um, there's our other argument like, oh, you can get everything you need from your diet. And my response is. How do you know? Yeah. Because, the, the, you know, you, you look online, you say, how much vitamin C is in 100 grams of broccoli? And they'll be like, there is 35 milligrams of vitamin C in 100 grams of broccoli. And I always respond to that. How do you know? A lot of this is based on the work of McCants and Willison. It's like an old, old book. So what, if anyone's ever, ever struggling with their sleep, having any bouts of insomnia, get yourself a copy of The Composition of Foods by McCants and Widdison. Any of my fellow nutritionists, dietitians out there that have been through the study will know exactly what I'm talking about. McCants and Widdison, it's just pages and pages and pages of the nutritional breakdown of every food you could possibly imagine. It's a ridiculous foundation to base any kind of nutritional strategy from because so many variables affect the levels of nutrients. So, you, OK, let's carry on with the broccoli example. You, they, you say there's 35 milligrams of vitamin C and 100 grams of broccoli. OK, are we talking about broccoli that you picked from the end of your garden 10 minutes ago and you've lightly steamed it or stir fried it? Or are you talking about broccoli that's been flown over from Uruguay that's been sat like in, in cold storage, then on the supermarket shelf for God knows mm. how long? You've boiled it within an inch of its life. Are you telling me that the nutritional composition of these two plates of food are going to be the same? If you think so, then... You're in the wrong job. Hang up your hat. Go do something mm. else. It's it's like okay, these things can give us a guide. We know there's going to be some in there. There's going to be some vitamin C in there. There's going to be some magnesium in there. There's going to be some X Y Z in there. 
but there's no 100% guarantee that you're, one, going to get the RDA, or two, you're going to get anywhere near optimal doses. So that's why I will say for most people, a good daily multivitamin, there's a strong argument for. And because these fatty acids are so vital for uh, neurological development, cognitive development in children, get them in. Get them in in as many, in, when he, in <laughs> as many ways as you possibly can. Yeah, absolutely. Really sound advice. And and you, you mentioned there about the steaming and the, and the boiling within an inch of its life. Um, do you have any sort of overarching recommendations on how we prepare things like uh, vegetables um, to, to maximize the uh, health benefits out of them. I know there's some things I, I heard about this recently. I, 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 I make a smoothie in the morning with um, a variety of different fruit and vegetable and I, I've been putting kale in it. Uh, and I heard recently that actually that's not a good idea. And actually kale um, can't be broken down correctly in raw form. And you see all of, all of, all of that, all of that is like, you know, the, the, it's, it's quite nonsensical as well, because like, you know, this is one thing that you'll find with nutrition, right? Here, here is here is like how nutrition works generally. Okay, so this is the situation apart from when it's not. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that is nutrition in a nutshell, right? Um, th- there's there's so many variables that determine that, and and you'll tie yourself in knots. Keep doing it. Keep putting the cane in the smoothie, <laughs> because at the end of the day, it, it, just just focus on getting that food yeah. in there. Some people will be able to absorb certain things better than others. Some because you know we we're all, always the end product of gene environment interactions. At the end of the day, so create the best environment that you can. You can't you can't really do much about your genes. You can activate certain genes, and you can you can switch off certain genes. But they but the the fundamental genes that determine how well you use those things, you can do absolutely nothing about it anyway. So why mm. worry? Just make sure that the environment is as good as it can yeah. be. Um, but in terms of best ways of cooking, I, I'll say for, for veg, um, steam, saute, stir fry, bake, stroke, roast. Okay. I'll tell you what, roasted broccoli. Oh. I haven't tried that. I'll have to check, I'll have to check that out. Oh, oh, it's, oh, it's gold. It's gold. Like, with a nice tahini dip. So, so sort of uh, like garlic, lemon, tahini dip. Um, break the, the broccoli into individual florets and a little bit of olive oil and a little bit of salt or maybe some garlic powder as well. Roast it and it gets kind of crispy. It's soft in the middle and gets like sort of a crispy edge to it, an amazing texture. That dunked into the into the tahini dressing. Oh, my word. Sounds good. I'll have to try that one out. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, last point I wanted to cover was um, something that I, I often cover on this podcast, which is a very important topic to me of mental health. Um I'd love to know um, your thoughts on foods that we can eat that are beneficial for prevention, protection against things like anxiety and depression. Now, I know clearly there's a lot of genetic interplay that goes in behind that, but I also know that the the gut-brain axis is something that's really important uh, and something that maybe we can leverage with your knowledge to, um, to improve our brain health and that sort of thing. There's so much to this. There really is so much to this because the the thing is, I mean, you know, like any other physiological system, the brain and the nervous system has its own specific nutritional requirements, and if those aren't met, then there's then certain aspects of function are going to be affected. And like any other physiological system, you can manipulate nutritional intake in order to instigate certain physiological responses. But it's it's one of the few systems. I mean, like. I guess the cardiovascular system potentially can can come into this because of its direct links with with the nervous system and and some of the responses. But our brain chemistry obviously influences how we feel. Our brain chemistry can be influenced by the internal biochemical terrain in the body, i.e. nutrition or alcohol or uh, pollutants or drugs or whatever. But it could also be influenced by external experience. And that's why it becomes so much more tricky because you could have the best diet in the world, but if if like, you know, your best friend drops dead, you're gonna you know, you're gonna go through hell. And it doesn't matter what's what, what what's going on with your internal environment, you're still gonna be having those incredibly um, traumatic responses. So it, 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 there are so many variables to it, and, and, and nutrition is only a you know one part of the picture. I mean, we've spoken about omega three. I don't think we necessarily need to revisit that. I mean, that's an important one for making sure that your neurotransmitters are doing the best job that they can. With anxiety, magnesium is quite important. 
because one of the things that magnesium will do is actually increase the um, the production of a neurotransmitter called GABA. And GABA is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. So when you're in the full throes of, of anxiety and your mind's going a million miles an hour and you're in that kind of real sympathetic tone, you know, your, your heart rate's up and your blood pressure's up, magnesium will bring that down via GABA because your GABA goes up, that will bring those sympathetic responses right back down again. Your, your mind will feel calmer, your heart rate will slow, you'll get a bit of a vasodilation, so blood pressure will go down and you'll feel a little better. Uh, B vitamins are vital for neurotransmitter production and synthesis. Certain key amino acids like tryptophan, for example, um, a that is the, the metabolic precursor for serotonin. serotonin. Yeah. All of these things. Ah, oh, right now the serotonin thing. Ha <laughs> ha! I think you spoke about gut before. One of the things that drives me absolutely bonkers, okay, because 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 obviously mental health is a hugely important thing. Because gut health has become one of the the like nutritional darlings of the yep. moment, particularly on uh, social media. And because of the discovery that like seventy to eighty percent of our body's serotonin is in the gut everyone has kind of put two and two together and come up with 178. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, like, they're like, oh, you've got to, got to make sure your gut's healthy because that's where all your serotonin is and that's going to elevate your mood. It's just like serotonin does more, you know, it's not a one-trick pony. Serotonin's role is determined by where it's found, okay? Serotonin is involved in blood clot- clotting and platelet function. Is it like, keep your blood healthy, you won't get depressed? <laughs> um, it's involved in bone mineralization. You know, it's, it, it regulates osteoblast activity okay so it's 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 very important in bone mineralization it's like healthy skeleton won't get depressed but it's it's just like you know they're they're, they're linking gut health because everyone's talking about it to depression i mean sure if you're constipated you're not exactly going to be whistling dixie whilst you skip down the road but um serotonin in the gut does gut stuff in the gut serotonin's role is to regulate peristaltic tone that rhythmical contraction that helps things move along to their kind of final trajectory it's got nothing to do with what happens in the brain serotonin in the brain does brain stuff serotonin in the gut does gut stuff so that's a myth that we really really need to put yeah. to bed yeah there is there is a gut brain access um and there does seem to certainly be some interesting activity between um the microbiome and certain neurotransmitters within the brain and certain you know what kind of central nervous system neurotransmitter release but it's so early. It's far too early for us to draw any kind of conclusions. The only conclusion that we can really draw is like, well, make sure you're following a good, healthy whole foods diet, which not only will keep your gut healthy and not only will nurture a good microbiome, but will also provide you with a lot of the, the precursors and cofactors needed for healthy brain and nervous system anyway. So do you believe in things like uh, kombucha, um sauerkraut yeah, those great. sort of things for being beneficial yeah, they're, I mean, they're great I, I, I can see all of those things they support a healthy microbiome the microbiome has got we start to see more and more and more key roles that it plays i mean especially with like immunity as well i mean with with immunity it gives us barrier it gives us barrier function it um it, it helps to support the health of the tight junctions which are like little proteinaceous bands that that hold enterocytes together to stop kind of immune complexes or partially digested food substances from actually going through the gut wall in, like in an incorrect manner it's got so many roles to play there's direct communication with like the payers patches that we spoke about when we're talking about mushroom polysaccharides so there is um you know cytokine regulation going on via the microbiome it's incredibly important in a million and one different ways so yeah those foods are great for supporting that okay sweet and and the magnesium point again is that something that um is easily found in food, or is that another thing that we should be looking for? Any green vegetables. Any green vegetables. Green vegetables. Yeah, because it's a real key part of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll, chemically, is the same kind of shape as hemoglobin, but obviously in human hemoglobin, we've got iron bound to the, the four protein units that are in there. But with um, chlorophyll, you've got magnesium bound to those those things. So the, the greener it is, the more magnesium's in there. You find it in nuts and seeds as well. Um, I would use a supplement if, if you... I mean, I, I use I use magnesium for anxiety. So if, if I'm going to go on like this morning or something, go to the studio, I will bang like three magnesium. Oh, really? Now. That's interesting. So yeah. you use it so actively. I'm not sitting in the, Hello? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'll, I'll use it like that. I'll, I'll kind of 
you know, it's better than taking a beta block. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, do, it does the job. Um, I sometimes take it before bed as well. I'll do, I'll do like a stack um, with 5 HTP and magnesium. Okay, interesting. So magnesium, you, you get in the GABA and 5 HTP. Yes, that is the precursor to um, serotonin. But at night, serotonin converts into melatonin, which kind of gets you to sleep. Um, so I've, I always take that combination to America. So I go over to the, well, I used to before before the dreaded Ronies. Um, I, I used to go over to the US a lot, and I always take magnesium and five HTP to kind of get back into the sleep pattern as quickly as possible. Brilliant, that's a really good tip. Um, yeah, so I, I use it quite a lot in in supplement form. Nice. Oh well, I'll definitely, I'll definitely add those to the uh, to the armamentarium because um, yeah, live TV is certainly pretty stressful, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It certainly is, yeah. But it's great fun. It's awesome. I've been Absolutely. Doing, been doing it years. Absolutely. But, I think, but you always get, a, you know, there's always a little bit of that, a little bit of that. But I mean, that, that kind yeah. of gives you the, the the spur. Yeah, completely. I wish I'd taken yeah. some magnesium before I went on Dragon's Den. <laughs> that oh, really? Would have, that would have helped, well, maybe. I, I, know, I, I know Tuka. He's a good lad. Oh, do you? I do, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a good lad. Um, brilliant. Okay, so to finish off, quick rapid fire round, um, and then that'll be, that'll be us for today. But... Um, couple of questions here so what would your last meal on earth be oh man probably some really good sushi nice nice choice yeah i'm a big fan yeah. as well have you got have you got a favorite sushi restaurant in london so we can in london um or anywhere actually you know, you- Oh, anywhere. There's well, some incredible. I used to live in Japan. There's some oh, okay. Incredible ones. Yeah, in uh, obviously the, the really famous one in Tokyo Station is absolutely incredible. Um, there's one in in Fukuoka. I can't remember the name of it, but it's at the bottom of like a, a bank tower, and it's a tiny, tiny little place, and people queue around the block for it. Um, that's incredible. In London, there's there's one called uh, Dozo, which is actually in Soho. Okay. And it, it, you wouldn't think that it's that great, but it's awesome. It's fantastic oh, sushi. And then you've got sticks and sushi as well. They're all they're always consistent. Yeah. So Dozo, what is that? D O Z O. Z O. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah, I'll check that one out. Dozo means go ahead. Yeah. Right. Okay. Dozo. Yeah. Well, now that we're able to go back to restaurants, I'm I'm looking for uh, yes. for any recommendations I can get. Yeah. Um, what do most people get wrong about you? Oh God! I've if got anything. no idea. I've, I've, I've got no idea. I, I really wouldn't wouldn't know what most people's. Um... <laughs> does the, does your name does your name does a medicinal chef like lead to any sort of false yeah. interpretations or anything? No, not really. No, there is one. You know, um, yeah, I probably won't mention the one thing people get wrong about me. They, they, you know, <laughs> apparently, I have a quality. They, you know, a lot of people assume that I one side of the fence when I'm actually, you know, the other. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is bizarre, which, uh, you know, much to my girlfriend's amusement, but, yeah. um, that's probably the only thing. Consistent. Okay. That's a good. That's a funny one. Yeah. To be fair. Yeah. It's very difficult to put that kind of, um, politically correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And what are you most grateful for right now? Um, to, to have had a, a long sustainable career and to have a career that's, that's been able to, survive the challenges that that have been going on in the world at the minute because you see so many people that are obviously you know their 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 businesses and their livelihoods have been so drastically affected by everything that's been going on and you know I certainly feel feel grateful that I found that I I found the resources to be able to build a business that's been able to withstand what's what's going on you know I'm very very I'm grateful that I found the likes of, you know, Brendan Richard and Russell Brunson and all those kind of people, the, the real key um, teachers about building digital commerce and stuff like that. And I, don't, I think if I wouldn't have had that, I would have, I would have been in a lot of trouble. So I'm really grateful for that, definitely. Brilliant. Well, you're clearly, clearly very passionate about it, which always helps, I think. Yeah. Uh, and finally, the question that we ask to, to every guest on the show, uh, what is the one small change that you have made that you wish you'd made earlier in life? Oh, um, invested in index funds. Nice, interesting one. Yeah, I wish I would have started when I was like eighteen. But the power mind. of the power of compounding would have been more exactly. in your favour. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I think yeah. probably if you add another one. My my friends my my friends started uh, mining Bitcoin about about like however many years ago it was, but five, six, seven years ago when they were just like a couple of quid each time, and he was going on about it and on about it and on about it, and I was just like. I wish I'd have bought some. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, th- I think we, I think we all have that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll have to stick to our safe uh, index, index link tracker yeah. funds now. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> 
Brilliant. Well, Dale, uh, absolutely fascinating conversation. I could have probably gone on for a, for another hour uh, on a variety of, of different topics, but we'll save that for a round two, maybe. But thank you so round much two, for coming on. Yeah, uh, no really worries. interesting. And uh, yeah, see you next time.